Hisab Pay. I don't know if you guys know Hisab Pay, but basically uh, they're using Algorand to uh, create a digital uh, Afghan Afghani. So in Afghanistan, the currency the currency is called the Afghan Afghani, um, and the Afghani is, AGN is like used uh, to use, of course, as local currency. But but I feel like having a layer two that's job is to just batch transactions and speed things up probably means your layer one isn't 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 performing to to to, to, to the right level because so many of these countries and governments and 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 you know even Europe or the Fed or these ma major organizations that manage, uh, you know, the global fiat system, of course, they, they need an element of, of control on this. They need an element of oversight on it. Today I have a special guest, uh, John Woods, uh, who is a CTO at Algorand, uh, and we'll be talking Algorand uh, technology and plans. Welcome to the show, John. Jack, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. You know, uh, speaking with folks like yourself who are out there running channels like this, getting the message out, it takes huge amounts of work for people like you, uh, you know, uh, getting up and getting involved with the, with the ecosystem and getting the message out. So uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to your viewers and your listeners. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, that, that's my pleasure. Actually, you know, I go into projects which are building some interesting uh, tech and Algorand certainly is one of them. And sure. I'm so happy to have you uh, here. Uh, so, John, uh, you have uh, spent uh, years working as an architect for other projects like Cardano, Ethereum, uh, but you also work uh, for Central Bank of Ireland. I found this on your LinkedIn. So pretty uh, diverse uh, portfolio, I would say. Uh, so yeah. can you spend a bit talking about uh, your uh, history experience and how did you uh, get into the point uh, where you are right now? Sure, absolutely. So um, I studied uh, computer engineering in university. Um, <clears throat> and my first role, uh, I worked with Ericsson, which is a global telecommunications company. And um, folks will probably know Ericsson. Uh, some people know them for building mobile, mobile phones, like the Sony Ericsson mobile phones. But actually, their bigger business is... The what's called Utran networks, which is really the the, the cell towers, the masts, uh, the con the radio network controllers, which are huge computers that control many cell towers at the same time. And so, the the code base to manage all of the telecommunications networks around the world, whether it's T-Mobile, Verizon, or in Europe, you know, uh, Vodafone and companies like that, they those guys are the customers of Ericsson. And so, the, Ericsson's just huge. And I was dumped in uh, to my first job with millions of lines of C plus um, plus. Built in IBM Rational Rose, which is a real-time embedded uh, embedded systems uh, IDE, and so it was tough. Uh, I realized probably after a week two, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But it was a gr good experience because it taught me, hey, you know, work is different to university, and the stuff you learn there is totally different to the real world of engineering. Um, and then I kind of, uh, you know, I, I left Ericsson after two years because um, they moved operations, they moved D out of Ireland. Uh, where I was, I was like in my early 20s, um, and they moved to Nanjing in China, and I didn't want to move to China uh, because it was just a too 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 stark a, a change for me when I was so young and I had my friends around me and stuff. So um, I jumped into finance for a while. Um, so I worked uh, with Citibank, uh, which is American bank, of course, uh, as a forex trader. Um, I worked in London for a while uh, on foreign exchange derivatives. So again, kind of like trading and 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 and, uh, and fintech. And when I was there, I learned a lot about uh, foreign exchange options and exotic derivatives and and, and other financial instruments. Um, but again, you know, I was still doing computery stuff, right? So uh, I was working on um, you know pricing and risk manage models. I was working on things like. Uh, uh, explaining Black Shoals to people, explaining Vanna Volga to people, or uh, helping test local stochastic volatility models. So it's still kind of like in that intersection of finance, mathematics, and 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 computer engineering, right? Because we're still building software. Um, then I, you know, after a few years, uh, about six years of that, I, I moved uh, back to Ireland and, and worked for the central bank and the European Central Bank, and that's where I got interested in cryptography, which is really the the first kind of step I took into kind of professional. Uh, security engineering, because, you know, computer engineering is, is of course, the art of computer science, uh, you know, coupled with building, uh, building systems. Um, but cryptography and security engineering is a totally different kind of 
you know, subfield of computer engineering. And so it's quite hard to break into unless you, you study, um, you know, cryptography or, or applied mathematics in university. And I hadn't done that. And so it was a very steep learning curve. Uh, but I really fell in love with, uh, with cryptography when I first kind of started to get into it. I was really just hooked on it. So, you know, it came about because I was building systems for, for banks that required that really required applied cryptography. It required taking primitives like hash functions or digital signatures or, or encryption and building larger systems with them. But um, I started to, rather than just kind of go, oh, okay, this is a hash function and this is a, a signature function, let's just apply them. I was really kind of sucked into how did they work and I started to study things like RSA, which is, of course, a very well-known um, asymmetric cryptography scheme that, that's used globally for, for many different things. Started learning about, you know, about trapdoor functions, about um, how prime numbers can be used to, to build these kind of systems. And then, of course, onto elliptic curves, and, and uh, which is used, of course, by um, Algorand and Bitcoin and Monero and Cardano and all the cryptocurrencies out there. And so, um, yeah, that was really kind of how I got into it. I, I, I then transitioned out of banking purely into software architecture where I worked with consensus on, on Ethereum. Um, and then I was... When I was there, I started to lead uh, applied cryptography. So I started to know enough about this stuff that I could actually uh, develop things there. Um, and then finally, uh, onto Informatica, where I was a security engineer. Uh, then finally, as the architect on Cardano, uh, and then uh, to where I am now. So I guess the last decade or so, I've been working in applied cryptography, software architecture, and building uh, robust digital, you know, robust uh, distributed systems. Okay, that, that's amazing. I mean, that sounds like a a uh, piece of uh, excellent experience, uh, especially the cryptography and, and security. That's uh, what uh, we uh, also uh, need at Algorand. I mean, Algorand is, is very, very strong in this regard, I guess. Uh, yeah. I'm curious about like, uh, why did you choose Algorand? Uh, I, I think just before Algo, you've worked for Cardano, right? For some yes, time, right. Uh, I would months think... or something. And so why, why are you coming from IOHK to, to Algorand? Right, so IHK, as you as you as you correctly say, is basically Cardano Inc. The Inc. behind Cardano, they developed the Cardano blockchain and the protocol and all the tech there. And the tech stack there is similar to Algorand's in the, from a cryptography point of view. They use Libsodium, they use uh, the VRF, they use Silvio Macali's uh, VRF uh, primitive. Um, but th the rest of the stack is based on on Haskell. Um, so they, they they code predominantly in Haskell. And of course, the architecture is different to Algorand. So I was there for about a year and I was the chief architect. I was the lead architect. So the uh, all of the other architects reported into me and, and, and applied cryptographers and that. Um, and I had a, a great time building Cardano. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a sophisticated system. It's very well engineered. And man, there are some, of course, brilliant people over at IOHK like there are at many of these firms. And so had a, I, I learned a lot and it was great. Uh, the reason I decided to, to come to Algorand was because well, one, it was an opportunity to be CTO, and I thought that was exciting, right? The step up away from the architect kind of level, which is obviously a senior engineer, role, but it's it's not a leadership role in, in a pure sense. Um, I really was hoping I'd be able to do what I'm doing now, which is set strategy and vision for something like Algorand, where I'm doing things like AlgoKid and other really strategically important things. Um, but we can talk about them a little bit later, maybe. Um, but beyond CTO, which is, of course, you know, something I aspired to be, um, it was also because when I looked at Algorand's technology stack, um, it really spoke to me. It was really very, very interesting. Um, and like I said, I've worked professionally for two years on Ethereum. I, I worked professionally on Cardano. Um, and when I looked at the entirety of the stack, the and so what I mean by the distributed systems engineering, the relays, the participation nodes, uh, the, the way that the consensus operates, the VRF, uh, the way data propagates, um, the ledger rules, and overall the architecture of Algorand as a whole, I thought to myself, wow, this is a product, this is a, a, you know, a project that is fit for purpose, that can give a killer user experience to developers. And I thought, ultimately, when I'm assessing uh, programmable platforms like Algorand, I think to myself, these things are distributed operating systems. They're basically platforms that you write apps for that execute in a decentralized context rather than just locally on your computer in front of you. And I want my operating system to be fast, secure, easy to use. And so Algorand was checking most of those boxes. It was certainly fast, secure, and it had a beautiful architecture. It didn't have a great developer experience before we launched AlgoKit, I, I feel. And, and so that's one of the things I did when I arrived, tried to improve the developer user experience. Um, but when I looked at the whole package, I thought, wow, 
uh, Algorand is something that I want to be part of that story. I want to be part of the success of something that was so well engineered. So for me, it was a great opportunity to be selected by by the team. And by the way, you know, during my interview, it wasn't just Stacy, the CEO at the foundation, who interviewed me, and 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 my peers at the foundation. I also interviewed with uh, most of the of the folks at uh, Inc. I interviewed with Paul Regal, John Gennati, Jason Weathersby. Garrett Maloof. So these are, you know, VP of engineering, DevRel, product, you know, uh, applied research. So I interviewed with everyone. And so, uh, you know, I just was blown away with the team and just really want to be part of that, uh, part of, of telling that story. So I, I was grateful to be selected. Yeah, excellent. I mean, the technology of Algorand is uh, beautiful and it takes time to, to understand the beauty of, of the tech. And uh, especially you've mentioned some like uh, like uh, VRFs or zero knowledge proofs. Uh, not many recognize that Silvio Mikali is responsible for for this uh, stuff. And other projects uh, use it, uh, and they actually use the uh, like uh, work and the, the the something what is uh, you know from Silvio Mikali uh, like uh, art. Uh, I would say. Uh, so, I totally agree. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, as a CTO, you've mentioned you, you are a CTO. So uh, you also mentioned Algo Kit. We'll, we'll touch this in a while. Uh, what is it exactly? But as a CTO, not everybody may understand what is this. What are the responsibilities of, of a CTO, or what is your vision for 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 this role? Like, where would you like? Yeah, sure. to be? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good question. You know. Um, I mean, if you go to Wikipedia, uh, it'll tell you a CTO is basically uh, the chief technology officer, the person who's responsible ultimately at the, at the company and accountable for, or any company, accountable for um, the technology stack and the product, the technology products that are used and, and the, the strategy for technology. So it is uh, a very important role, especially in a, in a technology company and, and, and increasingly so even in non-tech companies where technology is just a fundamental uh, requisite of business. Um, more than, so, so a lot of CTOs can be business people who maybe are, are not that technical. Um, of course, most will have some technical understanding, but, but you'll see in a lot of companies <clears throat> that I've worked in, certainly when I've reported to, to various CTOs, they may or may not be as technical as you might expect. I, on the other hand, have come from kind of a very, I didn't come from a business background. I came from a technical background. I built myself from software engineer to senior engineer, to an architect, to a principal architect and to an applied cryptographer. And so. I, I, I take a lot of pride being what I call vertically integrated in the role. And what I mean by that is I don't sit in some kind of ivory tower telling people what to do, but instead I, I, I am very much uh, a person who's on the team who wants to fundamentally understand what we're doing, who wants to fundamentally understand the outputs of the team and, and, and what they're struggling with. And I like to think that I'm a strong member of the team technically so that I'm able to do the work that I'm asking other people to do. Um, so it's important to me. It's only, it's a personal thing, but I just like to have that authenticity with my work to make to, so that the team feel like they're, I'm one of them and, and, and not just someone telling them what to do. Um, in terms of the things that, that I think are important, I think it's important when you, when you're building a team, um, whether you're a CTO or not, you can be just a team leader or you can be a, you know, an engineering lead or a VP of engineering. It doesn't matter. Um, when you're leading engineering, it's very important just to have a strong empathy with the team and, 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 and build a team where people feel like they're working in a safe environment. And they're also work, when I say safe, I mean like in a comfortable environment where, where they respected, respected is the key yeah. word. Um, and also where you build a team uh, where folks work hard and are collaborative and collaboration within tech is very important. On my teams, everyone is able to ask questions, even you know stupid questions. I think it's really important that um, everyone is brought on the journey together. Um, and more, more, more specifically at Algorand, of course, the technology, when I say the technology, the, the, the tech of the protocol is pretty damn great. And I don't have uh, a ton of stuff that I would like to change there. There's, there's some things that I talked to Gary and Paul about, and they are, they are of course, the leadership over there uh, at the Inc. And, and, and they're ultimately responsible for it. And, but we're very much aligned, them and myself, on, on you know, what, what, are, what are the things to do next? Um, They've brought to me kind of their roadmap, and I think it looks fantastic. And those things are further post-quantum resistance, um, you know, in, in addition to state proofs, which secure the history of the chain. We're also kind of looking at um, uh, quantum proof, uh, or not quantum proof, but quantum resistant uh, consensus, quantum resistant signature schemes, although there's some there's for payments, but there's some, some way off. Um, further decentralization. So what is the evolution of relay nodes? How do they look like in the future? 
Uh, do we consider, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networks or more gossip style networks and other things like that? Um, looking at consensus, uh, what is the evolution of consensus? Where does that go next? Is there some kind of incentivization? Uh, how do you deal with MEV and other things like that? You know, uh, uh, maximal extractable value. Um, but but other you know other than those kind of evolutionary things that ha have to happen for every project out there, if you look at the the fundamental technologies and the fundamental architecture of Algorand, the Algorand node itself, which is the heart of the network, it's beautiful and there's not that much to change. Um, and so that's why when I said at the start of our, our chat, you know. Probably the most important thing that I felt needed the most work was the de developer user experience. And so I, the reason I realized this was when I was doing the interviews with, with, with everyone, I wanted to make sure that I was asking good questions in the interviews. And, uh, and that's good for, for anyone interviewing. You got to make sure you understand the company you're interviewing for. But I also wanted to be able to be to demonstrate that I used the technology and I understood it. And so I thought to myself, OK, this is going to be easy, you know, because I've worked on Ethereum. I know the EVM inside out. I've worked on Cardano. I know Plutus inside out. I know these distributed systems. I know the cryptography. I don't need to research it or, or study up on it. So I thought, okay, I'll leave this. I'll leave this to a day or two before the interview, and I'll, and I'll spend some time. I get to sit down. I'm like, okay, I'm going to launch an NFT. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just like write a simple, a simple uh, smart contract and, and submit it to mainnet. And then the struggle began. You know, I'm downloading the node. I'm, I'm playing with goal. I'm trying to like fund an account. I'm like uh, trying to understand the difference between a logic sig and a regular smart contract. Um, I'm looking at like plugins for VS Code and I can't see any. Uh, I'm like, where's Truffle and where's Hardhat? Where's Ganache? Where's Drizzle? Where's where's like the simulation environment? Where how do we debug? And then I realized, is it Reach? No, it's not Reach. That's a third party thing. Is, is it is it like Algo Builder? Well, that looks pretty good, but it's it doesn't feel native. And I'm like, well, what is the way to do this? And so. And to be quite honest, I got on the call with these guys and I said, guys, I, 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 and Stacy as well, I said, I think, I think we need the biggest problem here is developer user experience because people, if people can't build the apps on the chain, um, it's, it, without the struggle I just went through, I mean, how many people are starting to build an app but then give up because it's just too, too tough? And that was where the, the, the concept for Algo Kit was born. Um, I hired a wonderful team around me to, to do that. I, I have support from from many folks at the Inc, Paul and, and Anne and other and Gary and other people at the Inc. But at the foundation, it's myself, of course, <clears throat> and Alessandro, uh, who's our, our, our head of product for AlgoKit, and then our partners in, in MakerX, uh, who are, have been terrific. And we built a set of requirements. And we sat down and said, what does a good developer user experience look like? And this is like nine months ago, right? Um, and we sat there and we just wrote it down. And we talked about rather than like look at what was wrong, I, I kind of I thought, what does it need to look like? And then I looked at all the grants we had, right? Because the foundation has given loads of money to, to many projects. Yeah. And, and the problem is when you give money to different projects, you kind of lose track of when there's many of them, you lose track of where they are, you lose track of what's being maintained. And so I took like the best of the of the open source projects, whether it was maybe uh, Dapflow or uh, Algo Pytest. There was a handful of of interesting projects that were that were useful. I kind of got them um, and added them to, to the list of requirements and then sat down and, and with MakerX and with Alessandro and we kind of built out this vision for AlgoKit. And I think if you look at version one, which we released uh, just at the end of March, I think like, like a week and a half ago, we've had 2000 downloads, by the way, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. Hopefully the, min, the, the momentum will keep up, but it's a, it's a testament when you see those when you see those graphs on Twitter that say like Algorand's got ten developers that's bullshit right, um, but yeah we, we we if you look at Algorand version one man it is great and I don't need everyone to tell me it's great all the time I'm happy to hear where, where, where it's not great it's not perfect and I want to know the things we can improve and by the way we have a killer roadmap for version two which is going to drop at the end of this year it's it's going to be killer right but even in V one you've got the core of what makes a good developer user experience. Step one, installing AlgoKit is easy peasy. I'm, I'm, if I'm a developer, I have a, a command, I have a, 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 a package manager in the command line, whether that's apt, pip, or brew on a Mac, okay, which is the closest a Mac has to a package manager. You're hitting brew install AlgoKit, pip x install AlgoKit, easy peasy, one line install. And it's not just pulling down AlgoKit and then leaving you in the trenches, it's checking does this person have the right version of Python installed? Does this person have all of these dependencies like chocolate and whatever else? And it goes and it grabs all of them if they're not there. It grabs the build tools if they're not there. It'll sort out, it'll check if you've got Git, it checks if you've got all the, all the prerequisites. And it builds the environment. And so 
it's gone from from the, from a, the case that there wasn't really at all a, a beaten track or a blessed path for how to do things to hey this is exactly how to do it this is one command to install the entire tool suite and what you get straight out of the box are tools that help you build test and deploy and so you have that command line tool to initiate your project you have that command line tool uh, to build a project you can open up VS Code and you've got the syntax highlighting. You can hit one button and it's launching a local node. It's funding the accounts. It's doing all the stuff that I struggled with in my interview process. Um, so yeah, I'm just super thrilled with it. Alexandro's done an amazing job. Maker have done an amazing job. And I think uh, we are on the right track finally for the developer user experience. Yeah, AlgoKit is uh, for sure a great uh, uh, stuff for algorithms. I, I think it's a uh, revolutionary in terms of uh, you know, addressing the uh, headaches of uh, Argo developers and uh, having you, someone who is hands-on uh, with the code and uh, also has a strategic view, I, I think uh, that's how we actually can drive Algorand uh, forward. And uh, so, so we mentioned some of the features of, uh, of Algo Kit. Uh, so let's say I have little experience as a Web2 developer. Sure. Uh, can I uh, do something easily with Algo Kit, or I still need to like learn all the blockchain stuff, all the, all these uh, nitty gritty details, or I can just like uh, follow my uh, typical steps and do some development with Algor Algorand with Algo Kit as a Web2 developer? Yeah, I think you can you can largely ignore most of the blockchain stuff. But here's what I'd say: whenever you're developing something, I think it's really important. Um, and it doesn't matter what language you're using, whether it's a markup language like HTML or it's a systems language like Rust or it's a distributed a distributed application like we're building with AlgoKit. It's really important for people to have some understanding of the fundamentals you know, with which they're working. And so I feel like if I, I don't even I don't know if it's a good idea to get to get development to a place where people have no idea that they're deploying to a decentralized you know, product or a decentralized platform. I, don't, I think that that's probably too much. Um, and I kind of have this feeling, and this is only a personal thing, but I have this feeling that in schools now, in universities now, I'm watching my, my, my little cousins, I'm watching family members who are much younger than me um, in university. I, I'm, I'm looking at the kind of things they're, they're studying because a lot of them are studying computers. Um, and really, you know, a lot of them don't know what a pointer is. They don't know what a register is. They don't know uh, what, a, what, what a stack is or the heap is. And I, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying you, you need to go back to like, everyone should be coding in machine code or, or, or assembly, but like, I think there's value in understanding the fundamentals. So what AlgoKit is there to do is not necessarily disguise the fact that you're building a blockchain-based application, but rather to make it so easy that it doesn't matter and make it so fast that it doesn't cost you a lot of money and make it so safe that you're when you're building it, um, you're less likely to have errors and rug pulls and other problems like that. And so, yeah, I think um, AlgoKit is going to help folks who are Web2 uh, engineers. It's going to help them build in a way where they have so Few, so, so much less questions and problems. Um, we're going to be adding to the number of templates. So it ships with some templates, but we're going to be adding to the number of templates. So when you're kicking off your project and you're saying, I'll go create a knit, my cool project, you'll be able to add a little command line flag and like dash dash, give it a template name. And so you'll be able to, within 10 seconds, roll an NFT. Within 10 seconds, roll a basic DAO smart contract, these kind of things. Um, so we're adding, we're going to be adding next week to the number of templates that are there. We only shipped one or two, I think. We're going to be adding uh, over time. By the way, uh, AlgoKit is also built in a way that um, very much like Git, it's kind of open and doesn't have any single source of truth in the sense of like, it doesn't have to use our templates. You can point at your own templates. Uh, you can have your own private Git repo with your, with your own templates and you can use AlgoKit to, to, to talk to them. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's going to, it's going to make the Web2 experience so seamless that people will be excited to build. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, I, I think we need the simplicity in, in the development uh, on Algorand. And you've mentioned that, you know, there, there are some fake news about number of Algo developers uh, in the space. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, how many active developers do you think we have right now in the ecosystem? 
Uh, you know, it's, it's it's a really good point. We were trying to put together some metrics in this the other day. I'm just typing into my laptop here just to see. I, I, I was talking to Jason, uh, who who leads DevRel globally for for Algo Algorand, and so we're trying to understand what what are the what are the metrics that matter. So, I mean, I'm going to read out a couple of a couple of the bits here that Jason put together. So he was talking about like well, portal views, right? We got this Dev portal. By the way, the Dev portal is going to be revolutionized soon. It's going to be just like Algo Kid. It's going to go through this. 180 in terms 180 degrees uh turn in terms of uh the user experience you're going to go to the dev portal it'll be like sitting uh in a theme park you'll just be brought on a tour of everything that's important and brought to the information that you need um but you know to assess the developer metrics you can look at portal views you can look at developer registrations you can look at the views of our youtube videos because we've just started a new developer youtube channel of course, there are other things like Discord members, right? And so we have tens of thousands of people in Discord that are interacting uh, every week. Um, messages per week, forum visits, of course, AlgoKit installs, um, AlgoKit, uh, you know, um, uh, deployments both on Brew and on, on Pipex, um, mainnet apps deployed, TVL, et cetera. So there's, there's many, many different ways to measure this stuff. And we're just we're kind of beginning to get metrics on it. So I, I don't have the numbers to hand, but I'll tell you this. It's tens of thousands of people who are interested in this stuff on Algorand specifically. Um, and sometimes you look at the fake news when someone, uh, you know, posts one of those pretty bar charts on 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 Twitter, and it's like, oh, you know, uh, Solana or whatever has like you know 42 million developers, and Algorand has got like six. It, it, it's simply not the case. And so, like everything in life, uh, just be careful what you uh, assume to be correct. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. And uh, you've mentioned that that even the algo kit. In the first days, had like a two thousand downloads. Uh, so did yeah. it already tell something, right? So yeah. I think it already shows like a, a scale, and also uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of applications uh, which are building on Algorand. They also need developers, right? So so we probably go into thousands, uh, if not more, of, of developers. So and and I've seen like a data which is uh, showing much lower numbers. So uh, anyway, I think with uh, AlgoKit, uh, we'll grow this developer base uh, pretty, pretty uh, smoothly. Uh, let's maybe come back uh, for a while to the to the core tech of Algorand. Uh, you're already like a nine months with Algorand, uh, so probably you know very, very well the, the strengths and weaknesses of Algorand, also comparing to Ethereum, comparing to Cardano and other, other blockchains. So uh, what do you think I, I like a unique strengths of Algorand uh, was, you know, differentiates us versus other uh, chains? Sure. Yeah. Good question. Um, and by the way, I, I would say, yeah, I'm absolutely not, I'm here. So just coming up on a year, uh, it's been a great journey so far. Uh, and the community are lovely. You know, I, I get a lot of, I get a lot of support from the community, a lot of love. And, and so that means a lot to me. Um, I would say as well, though, you know, I haven't had as, as much time as I would have liked to dive into the, into the code and into the into the architecture. I mean, of course, I'm trained by by the people who who, who build it, um, and I can spend some time on it. But like, uh, the one of the, the 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 sides of of the CTO job is that you end up meeting a lot of people, whether it's even interviews like this, or or indeed, you know, uh, just meeting with projects that are starting up and need support and need encouragement. So I do a, a ton of that stuff. I do like probably six or seven hours of that a day. So I don't get as much time anymore to be hands on with the code, but but I can still I can still absolutely answer. Um, so. You know, if, if you take, say, Cardano, uh, which I think is a very interesting protocol, uh, or you take Algorand or you take Ethereum, I think you can roughly slice these projects into kind of three kind of layers, okay? One is the ledger rules, so so the accounting rules uh, for, for the ledger itself. Two is the kind of consensus technology. So that is, of course, a very important part, whether it's the VRF, um, whether it's delegated proof of stake, uh, on Cardano or, or proof of stake on, on Ethereum, and then finally you've got the like the, the network layer. So how do, how does data propagate? What is the structure of, of of block propagation? How does that kind of stuff work? And largely these three things will be uh, most of the guts of the architecture. And so on Cardano, as an example, when people let's start with consensus on Cardano, you of course delegate your stake to pools. Um, and so the way you do that is uh, a Cardano account is actually two key pairs. It's two AD25519 elliptic curve uh, key pairs. Um, one is a payment key, one is a staking key. And by joining the public keys kind of together, more or less, 
it's a bit of a simplification, you kind of, you end up getting this kind of account that can both pay or stake. And when you want to stake to a staking pool, what you're really doing is signing a transaction with your stake key and posting a certificate online that points to the, ident the identifier of, of, of a pool. Mm -hmm. And so the, the funds don't leave your wallet. They just are kind of pointed at uh, a pool. And so this is fine. But what this means is that you have these clusters of, of, of pools uh, that represent, there's about kind of 2,000 pools or so. I mean, there's, there's more than that, but there's 2,000 pools that actually kind of have a chance of creating a block because the rest of them are way too small. So about 2,000, 2,500 pools um, that represent all of the consensus. Whereas on Algorand, as an example, one of its strengths is pure proof of stake. So Algorand is using the VRF, the verifiable random function, to basically, rather than uh, set up a, a reality where you have these concentrations of pools everywhere, where people are, pool, are pooling together, like pool mining, instead, the VRF is run on every block, all right, on every round, we call it a round, where a block is produced, where a block is you know, produced, validated, and added to the chain. And it's run in order to select someone from the, from the entire sea of people that are, that are participating in consensus. And what's cool about this is that pure proof of stake is kind of like solo mining for block production. And so um, in Bitcoin, you've got these big mining pools, same on Ethereum, you've got these staking pools, same on Cardano. On Algorand, it really, in, it really focuses on decentralization for consensus. And what it tries to do is make it so that consensus is truly uh, a one-person sport. It's truly the individual who's contributing to the security of the network. And those individuals are selected to create and validate blocks using the beauty of the VRF, which is a, a very elegant, um, probabilistic but deterministic uh, you know, function that's able to quickly sort the network, select a participant um, who's valid to produce a block, and select participants to validate and add the block to the chain. So it's very elegant. And in fact, by the way, Cardano uses the VRF as well, but what they use it for um, is to select what they call the leadership schedule, which is a, you know which pool is next to produce uh, a block effectively, more or less. Um, so the VRF is used in both technologies, Cardano and, and Algorand, but I think uh, at, where it was, at, at home, where it was developed on Algorand by Silvio Macaulay, I think, it's probably the most elegant implementation uh, of it in a consensus mechanism in the sense that it really encourages a single entity, a single person to be creating a block and helping with consensus. Um, so that's the consensus piece. I can dive a little bit deeper as well, if you'd like, on the, on the network side. Ledger rules are obviously quite complicated to discuss it verbally. But, uh, you know, what, what I think is interesting about, about uh, the network is, of course, Algorand enjoys this three and a half second block finality. Super cool. By the way, I want to just plug one of my favorite things different from Algorand to Ethereum here for one sec. On, on Ethereum, when you're producing a transaction, right? you, you make a transaction, you, you cryptographically sign it, you dispatch it to the network, you do the same thing on Algorand. But Ethereum has this like, every wallet has a nonce, this like number used once that you have to maintain per wallet. And so if you have five transactions and one, two, three, and uh, say one, two, and three go through and four doesn't go through, but you submitted five of them and that fifth guy has a has nonce number five, it gets rejected as well because number four didn't go through. You got to resubmit this guy with number four before you can submit this guy with number five. And this nonce management process is keeping state for every wallet, knowing what nonce you're on, um, making sure that transactions go through, it's a pain in the ass. And it gets even more complicated in the sense that all five transactions might go through, but then three blocks deep, you might have a block reorg where you've had a short fork in consensus and one of the forks dies away and now your transactions are on the wrong side of history and then they're reverted. And then you're going back on, well, which one of those transactions do I have to, what nonce am I on? You know, it's just a nightmare. And so Algorand, and this is so beautiful, this is probably the best bit for me from, from a, an engineering point of view. Huh? There is no nonces. You don't have to keep track of nonces within your account. You can just dispatch transactions as you want, blah, 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 as fast as you want. Um, you don't have to keep any state. And transactions, once they're in a block, you know that they're done. There's no block reorgs. There's no forks on, on Algorand. And so this is a critical and very important difference, especially for enterprise applications that really benefit from this with Ethereum. I can tell you, because I built them, 
nearly every enterprise grade application that I deployed on Ethereum when I was working in consensus, in fact, every one of them had a, a, an orchestration layer, like a big load of microservices, a big, like, a big deployment that had to be sitting in Kubernetes. And all of these microservices did the following things, manage the nonces, manage the ABIs, and managed uh, transaction orchestration, so replaying transactions that failed. And that technology was like thousands of lines of code just to manage that nonsense. And it all just goes away when you use Algorand. So that's very cool. And then lastly, uh, if we talk about, the, say, looking at Cardano again, which is, again, very well-engineered system, but different to Algorand. Consensus on, a, on sorry, the block propagation times on Cardano, uh, I don't want to lie about this. So actually, I think it's around kind of like two or three minutes at the moment. I'm not entirely sure. So, but it, it, it's a couple of minutes, say, okay. Um, and so it's fine, but the number of transactions per second that are going through is obviously a lot less than, than Algorand's. And so I think Cardano's probably at about 30 or 40 transactions a second. When I left, it was at about 25-ish. So it's, it's definitely improved since then. I don't know the exact numbers. It's reasonably quick. Um, but Algorand, of course, is an order of magnitude faster at, at, at about seven to 8,000 transactions per second. Now, the way that's achieved is true kind of a spoke architecture. So we have, at the center, we have the participation nodes that are producing the blocks. And they're connected to, at any one time, they're connected to four relay nodes. And those relay nodes, their job is to basically propagate that data to all of the other participants in the network, so all of the other participation nodes. And so you end up having this kind of like participation nodes in the center that, that are not connected to each other. They're connected to the relays and the relays are like propagating data around in, in a ring road around, around the network. And so this is very fast. Um, it allows us to have this block, block propagation time and block finality around three seconds, three and a half seconds for finality. Super cool. But of course, you're still relying on about 125 entities at the moment that host these relays. And so, I mean, the Nakamoto coefficient, if you want to call it that, is reasonably good. It's, it's you know, there's a whole bunch of different people who are separate companies, separate people who run these nodes. Um, and as I mentioned to Justin Bonds, you can run one yourself and point your participation node at it. But ultimately, I think this needs to evolve towards even further decentralization. So you, uh, you have the participation nodes, and there's thousands of them that are running. But with the relay nodes, there's only about 120. And so... We're working next to kind of evolve the relays to be um, potentially looking at things like peer-to-peer -peer messaging between participation nodes rather than necessarily always using the relays. So there's a fallback. Um, but we have to make sure that we do this in a way that it doesn't slow the network down. Um, so yeah, I think Algorand's uh, and, and, and block time is something that's just incredible. In the next update, it's going to be going down to about 3.2 seconds. So just touching that kind of two and a half, you know, just sub three second mark. Um, but you know the evolution is towards decentralization whilst preserving the speed uh, characteristics of the network. Yeah, the simplicity of the architecture of Algorand, uh, I think, is uh, like uh, unprecedented. So uh, glad that you mentioned that. Uh, obviously, Algorand uh, built a lot of uh, the features into the layer one, like uh, virtual machine, uh, Algorand standard assets, atomic transfers, wrecking, uh, state proofs recently, and then and, and some others. Uh, what makes Algorand, in my opinion, not only secure, fast, but also cost efficient? Uh, what are some other benefits of that? I mean, uh, do, do you think that's like a that, that, that this is a story that is compelling for developers? I mean, should they care about so many features in a, a layer one, why other blockchains are doing this on the next layers? Yes, absolutely they should. And so, you know, the reason Ethereum has Polygon as a layer two is because it's not hitting the requirement as a layer one. If Ethereum was able to process the transactions at a reasonable rate in a reasonable time, people wouldn't be using Polygon. So. I'm not saying there's no need for, for layer twos. They can be useful for, for potentially privacy things. They can be useful for um, compatibility. Like we have a layer two um, called uh, Milkomeda and its job is to provide Ethereum or EVM compatibility. Uh, uh, so you can execute EVM bytecode on uh, using Algorand's consensus. And that's great, okay? It's absolutely a valid reason to have a layer two. But I feel, and, I'm, and uh, you know, not everyone um, at the foundation shares this view or the ink and not everyone agrees with me, but I feel like, Having a layer two that's job is to just batch transactions and speed things up probably means your layer one isn't 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 
isn't performing to, 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 to the right level. And so Algorand doesn't kind of need those layer twos at the moment because it is performing uh, at the right level. Um, you know, you talk about those, those, those kind of very beautiful features of Algorand. You can do those things. You can do atomic transactions. You can do, um, you know, uh, the clawback and freeze type behaviors that we have with ASAs, uh, where people, you know, where you can have an administrative control over a native asset. You can do those things on Cardano. You can do those things on Ethereum. It just requires a whole bunch of extra contracts and then boilerplate code that's to go in. And you got to manage all those contracts and deploy them and make sure they're secure and all that kind of stuff. And so, the beauty of Algorand is again is it's in its elegance, as you said, and 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 the beauty of its engineering. And so, hey, it's much better if I can declaratively roll a native asset as an ASA without writing a line of code. So on Ethereum, you got to write an ERC twenty contract or an ERC seven twenty one. You've got to compile it and upload the bytecode. On Algorand, you just you can just declare a native asset. Um, on Algorand, you can, as you said, have these atomic groups of transactions. This is very great. This is a great thing, right? For businesses, they regularly want to kind of do a two-way swap where like, I'll give you that if you give me that, but I only want this to go through if that goes through, right? This is why eBay was created, right? This is why you have PayPal and stuff like that, right? You, you Sorry, not eBay, sorry, but but why you have PayPal, right? Um, you want to swap money for for goods. You want to swap money, you know, uh, algo for, for an asset. And isn't it great to have a native feature that both of those transactions either go through or, or, or not, neither do. And to do that without the overhead of writing all of this boilerplate management code is a wonderful thing. Um, and, you know, it, we're looking at ASAs again and talking about like the, the clawback and freeze features. So most times if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, using a, a ASAs as an NFT, you, you, you want that NFT to be self-sovereign to you. You want to be able to do what you want with it. So you, you don't want people to be able to freeze your NFTs or claw them back, of course, but enterprise applications, businesses, they use those kind of features all the time. And so as an example, if you have a local store that wants to do a loyalty program, Maybe they want to have a list of terms and conditions for that loyalty program, and they want to be able to claw back the tokens in some legal circumstance where they go bankrupt or something. And so for them, you being able to go down and collect your tokens as you shop within that store every week, great. Uh, and you're accumulating a balance, but they still have administrative control on that asset, which is fundamentally uh, an ephemeral token of loyalty, rather than something like an NFT, which is a forever token, right? And so having these level, this level of articulation built into the layer one, for free, for de so developers don't have to use this. And when you combine that with AlgoKit, which expedites the development process already, it becomes so much more cheap, so much more cost effective, both from an engineering and, and solution point, point of view, to take what your vision is for a, a decentralized application and build an algorand. It's literally going to save you engineering dollars to build an algorand when you don't have to worry about implementing these kind of primitives on your own. I think it's, I think it's super compelling. I mean. This kind of stuff is exactly what I'm talking about. This is why I came here to be part of this story, right? Because it's just that good. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, uh, I know there is a, another uh, beautiful improvement or product you're working on, which is the one-click uh, notes, which will make uh, you know it po very po you know easy and possible for everyone to to run a node. Uh, sure. So I have some questions related to that. Obviously. Uh, Algorand has uh, this uh, beautiful uh, pure proof of stake consensus mechanism. And uh, if my understanding is correct, in order to participate in the consensus, you need to run a node, right? You know, you need to have yes. your own node. <coughs> yes, you do, yeah. Yeah, so right now we have probably something like 2,000 nodes, uh, right? Uh, on the, yeah, the and, and I, we, I got a question uh, the other day, uh, why is the counter offline? So we have we have a metrics, like uh, I think it's metrics.algorand.org or something like that. We have a, a website that has uh, counter participation nodes. Well, <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. We found out that the the formula that was calculated in that was miscounting. If nodes were coming on and offline too too often, uh, they were being double counted or or not counted properly. Um, so we're just fixing that, and so we'll have, we'll have that uh, back to normal soon. But yeah, around two and a half thousand or so is the number of active nodes at the moment. Okay. In, in terms of consensus, yeah. Yeah, it went for like a to five thousand or something, uh, but yeah, that's and, double counting, right? And, and so that was that was really, I mean, again, I, I'm actually not technically working on the code myself, so I don't actually know for sure. But from from the report that I had, it was basically that uh, nodes were coming on and offline too 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 quickly, and then they were being counted twice. That was basically yeah. what the problem was. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, so one click nodes are. I think really important. And so, you know, I run nodes in my house. I run uh, an Algorand node. I run a Monero node because I'm a big supporter of Monero. It's a, another cryptocurrency, which is 
not like Algorand. It's not programmable. It's not. It's not. Not a, a Cardano style blockchain or Algorand style blockchain. It's. It's just trying to do. It's like Bitcoin, just money, and it's. It, it's. Its aim is to do privately. I think it's a cool project. Yeah. But I, I wrote both of these nodes because I, I. I like to support the network. The thing is, I have a bunch of Linux machines in my house, and I'm comfortable in the command line. So I get clone them. I. I. You know. I. I do a C make on it, and I. I build. I build the node myself. Not everyone has 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 computers that can do that, and not. Sorry, lots of notifications there. And not everyone has, um, I guess, the, the the technical savvy to do that. Here, here's another example of where I'm not as good, right? So the other day I was trying to get my, I've got like a, a Mac, an old MacBook and I wanted to put uh, a new version of, of Mac OS on it. But I had to download again an old version because it doesn't work with like the latest one. It's like, yeah, I got to get three back. And I was like, I'm trying to get this thing from, there's a command line thing, a Mac OS like software update. You can like give it some commands and you can say, download a full installer. I, I struggled for like 35 minutes. And then I finally found that there's this open source app. You download it and it's a GUI that lets you kind of like download any version of Mac OS from history. Super cool. So I used that, got my MacBook up running. So that was an example of a one-click download where I was struggling for about 30 minutes in my terminal. This is where I want to take one-click nodes. I want it so that it's as easy as that for people to, to use. So it needs to basically be that someone can hit a single command not worry about what computer they're on, what operating system they're on, or what in, what dependencies they have installed, whether they have Git or, or Make or, or, or GCC or any of these things, and just down get the source code or get the, the node up and running in a single command. And that's my vision for one-click nodes. And when we do that, it'll be so much easier for people to participate in consensus and to contribute to the security of the network. Now, I want to be clear. We're doing a lot. We're spinning a lot of plates at the moment, both in terms of the team uh the engineering team at attending events whether it's consensus which i'm going to or the various kind of uh, blockchain events that are at paris blockchain week etc um we have a small engineering team you know we're working on algo kit working on the dev portal working on xgovs and so the first version of one click, click nodes is going to be relatively basic it's going to be you know click here node gets deployed it's not going to be able to help you operate that node long-term as in uh, rotating participation keys and, and other things like that. Instead, I will have a guide that describes the steps to do that because of course, it's not just running a node, it's also issuing participation keys and, and, and having them on, on the node. But by the end of, so by Q, I'm hoping to drop in Q2, this first version of one-click nodes, which will help you get a node up and running so you can participate. Um, but in terms of making the operation piece easy, that'll be later on in the year. But I'm very excited about it. And ultimately it's the same theme as Alkit, which is, Make it easy for normal people who are not computer scientists to participate in this global network of value and 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 community. Yeah, looking forward to, to this one uh, as well. And uh, you know, uh, not sure if you also run a Bitcoin node. Uh, you've mentioned Manora node, and in Bitcoin community, there is this narrative that you know everyone should uh, run uh, a node. Sure. Do you think that for Algorand uh, as well, everyone should run their own node? And if yes, why? Uh, or maybe why not? Yeah, so interesting. You know, in Bitcoin, the, I think the theory around running your own node is not about running consensus. It's not about kind of participating in consensus as, as I'm suggesting we do with, 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 with uh, consensus nodes or participation nodes, as they're actually called. Yeah, it's starting to look, having uh, like visibility into the ledger and verifying the miners, right? Uh... Exactly. It's visibility into the, into the ledger. It's propagation of the ledger. And it's uh, being able to post a transaction to your own mempool. And so I actually think, I mean, I, I, I by the way, I used to run a Bitcoin node. I, I, run, I ran one in 2013. Uh, I was an early Bitcoiner, I, I kind of moved away from it. And I I, I, I don't have a lot of Bitcoin left. I, I, I'm, I'm, I think it's an in, certainly interesting. And I, I, I look fondly on it as a project, but I, 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 so I don't hate it or anything, but I, I um, it doesn't, it doesn't inspire me anymore. Um, but, but I, I, I know why it inspires people. Um, and so I don't run one anymore, but I do encourage people to get involved in this stuff because it's a great way to learn. Um, and the other thing is, I'll just call out one really cool thing about Bitcoin, right? Whether people like it or not, Bitcoin may not like have the latest and greatest technology, blah, 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 compared to insert your cryptocurrency here, but it has a very big fat hash rate. And that hash rate, it makes Bitcoin the most secure cryptocurrency on the network from a consensus point of view, because the millions and millions of dollars you have to spend, like billions of dollars you've got to spend in order to, to, to counteract that hash rate just makes Bitcoin uh, pretty bulletproof. 
yeah that, that, that's for sure and you know once you make uh, the one click note uh, you know so simple to use potentially you may expect you know we'll have like uh, 10,000 or uh, 50,000 uh, no nodes running uh, my well, question is do we need that and is algorand ready for that number of nodes so um Algorand, yeah, is, is ready for those number of nodes. Of course, uh, we can, it's a bit technical, but, but uh, also, although everything we've talked about has been technical on this show. So, uh, but, um, you know, you, when you're getting, when you're engaging a consensus, you're supposed to post a transaction to say, hey, I'm online. Um, and when you want to disengage consensus, you're, you're supposed to post a transaction to say, excuse me, I'm offline. But, you know, there's a little bit of education there that we have to explain to people, or even if it's easy to do, we still have the people have to understand what they're doing. And so, Algorand is fine with that number of nodes. I don't think it needs it though. I think it's not about the number of nodes. I mean, once the number of nodes goes over a certain number, okay, once it's over about 2000 nodes, I think it's pretty decentralized, right? You've got 2000 entities who are helping secure the network. And so to defraud the network, you're going to have to override a lot of individuals. And, and so it's functionally decentralized after about 2000, I think, as is Cardano, by the way. I think what's more interesting to me is getting more stake online. So right now we have about there's about 7 billion algo that have been like in circulation about 1.6 billion algo uh, just you know just under 2 billion is actually participating in consensus and for me more interesting is getting more algo in consensus because then it, it increases the cost of a security with the network if you have all the algo in existence that's all contributing to consensus then algorand is maximally secure and so you know for me, that that's the the, the value. But I, I don't need ten thousand people to be involved. I think it'd be nice to see an increase. But but uh, you know, anything over two is good. Yeah, yeah, I, I do agree. On the other hand, you've mentioned the relay nodes. Uh, we have like one hundred twenty of them, and in this regard, I, I think we we probably would like to have more relay nodes uh, in the future to support the centralization. Uh, yeah. Are there any like incentives for for somebody to run a node, either the participation node or the relay sure. node? Sure, sure. Great question. So, you know, so the answer at the moment is no. Um, but there's a question, maybe, maybe there should be. And so, uh, so um, you know, like we, we just talked about consensus. And, and so it's it's not expensive to run a participation node, right? Yeah. You can run one on, on, on a Raspberry Pi 4, 8 gig, right? You can run one on an old MacBook Air or whatever, right? But the thing about it is, is that you know, that still costs money for people to do that. It costs some time for people to do that. Um, and certainly, if you want to run a, a kind of a, a production grade, enterprise grade a participation node, you, you got to have an EC2 instance or some some cloud computer somewhere, right? More or less. And so, um, maybe we do need to think about incentivizing consensus with the fees or other other uh, ways. Um, and so, this is a conversation that's ongoing because, of course, Silvio's original vision was that. Algo itself, holding Algo itself, would would secure the network. But we've transitioned a little bit away from that in the sense that it used to be the case that, uh, and this is before I joined or anything like that, so I, I forgive any mistakes that I make it here, but it used to be the case that we would, um, people would receive a reward just for holding the algo, okay? And that kind of tied in with this notion that kind of running a participation node ma made sense because you were holding the algo anyway, so and you were receiving rewards, so why not run a participation node? And therefore holding the algo meant securing the network. Whereas now, Oh, uh, we've moved to governance. So people get paid for governance and there isn't a reward anymore just for holding the algo. And so we're, we're looking, I mean, I, I speak to Silvio, I speak to the, to the leadership at the Inc. And we're looking at different ways we can potentially incentivize node operation because I, I, I personally think, and this is only my personal view, long-term over the course of two to five years or whatever, we probably have to get to some place that incentivizes in some way uh, node operation if we, if we want it to become maximally decentralized. Yeah, because yeah. you need you need to give a reason for people to, to run these things. But we'll see we'll see how how it goes. There's lots of conversations going on. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, once you have uh, your own business around Algorand, your application, you probably want to have your notes. But for like a common folks, uh, uh, you know, if we want to go in this direction, probably some kind of incentives would be uh, helpful. Uh, exactly. So before we like a wrap up, uh, John, maybe some of the most interesting projects which you follow in the space. Recently, we have uh, we had this announcement of uh, TravelX building stuff for airlines. Yeah. I'm following personally Opulus. I think is great stuff. Some of the DeFi machines like uh, Fox Finance or Argo Fee. 
what are the most exciting projects and algorithms uh, in in you know which you are following or or maybe what are the projects which you sure. should, uh, we should have on an algorithm in the future sure absolutely and so um i don't want to if you're not in this list it doesn't mean that you're not great uh, yeah. of course i can't i can't i can't say everyone um but i'm, I'm a big fan of hesab pay i don't know if you guys know hesab pay but basically uh, they're using Algorand to uh, create a digital uh, Afghan Afghani. So in Afghanistan, the currency the currency is called the Afghan Afghani, um, and the Afghani is, AGN is like used uh, to use, of course, as local currency. But a lot of a lot of uh, people out there, especially women, uh, are in situations where they don't they don't have access to, to to high quality banking, and in some cases they are financially controlled by people who are they're living with and stuff. And so, of course, that's just the, the nature of, of of the reality out there at the, at the moment. But uh, Hasab Pay is basically, you know, an, an app that can run on any simple phone uh, that allows super easy on, on and off ramps in this like native, uh, you know, digital Afghan currency. And you might think, well, why don't they just use Algo? Because that you can just run that on a phone. But of course, merchants in Afghanistan don't necessarily know about Algo as an example, but they do. Now there's thousands of them that accept this digital Afghan uh, currency. And so now we're really actually genuinely empowering actually you know uh oppressed humans with this technology and they're 100 using algorand for the settlement and the movement of, of these currencies and that's probably to me one of the most inspiring use cases we've seen but there are other cool ones uh the new computer company ncc are doing some really interesting things around music planet watch are doing some really cool things around iot and and and, and uh environment and i think that's important right because we don't we want the world to be a nice place for our kids um, and yeah, I think I really like as well what NFD are doing. They've done some really cool stuff recently around like segments, sub segments. That's really cool stuff. So you can buy like woods.algo and then have like john.woods or dave.woods or whatever. Um, I like Pact as well. I, I see Pact do some kind of innovative things. They're, they're kind of DeFi. Um, but yeah, there's, there's tons of like, I get approached because of the nature of my work. I get approached all the time by people who are starting out and, you wouldn't believe some of the incredible innovations that are coming out. Of course, I can't blow the lid on, on their projects, but man, there's some very, very cool things in the pipeline, people building uh, for major things on Algorand. So watch this space. Yeah, for sure. I was actually not aware about this Afghani project. I need to uh, you know, study this as well. And uh, like uh, for anyone, if you want to start with Algorand, you know, NFD is probably like an easy way to have your uh, domain and uh, start the, the, the fun with, with Algorand. Maybe one more controversial question at the end. Uh, you know, two years ago, Algorand ha has this narrative or being the CBDC platform, thanks to the Marshall Island and others. Sure. Uh, do you think, uh, you know, we are still chasing the CBDC use case? So are there any POCs you are aware of? So, I mean, I, I know that Algorand Labs and Silvio are, are, are doing um, are doing things with, with, with kind of big banks and, and governments and things. I think there was news of, of, of an Italian bond issuance and there's other kind of like, you know, macro yeah. economic -y engineering that, that, that's going on. Uh, they're doing lots of lots of cool stuff. I'm not personally involved in that work, so I, I don't know it well. But what I would say is, you know, I worked on the European Central Bank's uh, proof of concept digital euro, like uh, it was called uh, Euro DLT. Um, and so they, they were looked, I, I think central banks and governments around the world are looking at a digital currency for a few reasons. Uh, number one, you know, it's cheaper to create digital currency than it is to create physical currencies. Uh, it's easier to manage and, 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 and other things, right? It helps with, 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 with monitoring and compliance and other things. Um, but I don't know if they're going to choose a public blockchain. And, and, and there's one, just one reason I'll say that, whether it's Ethereum, Bitcoin, or anything else, it's because I don't think any sovereign, any, any major country uh, any like, you know, uh, G10, like world economic power is going to want uh, the, you know, the the issuance or even the 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 operation of their national currency dependent on, on what is basically a decentralized third party developed uh, technology. Because so many of these countries and governments and, and, and you know, even Europe or the Fed or these ma major organizations that manage, uh, you know, the global fiat system, of course, they, they need an element of, of control on this. They need an element of oversight on it. And so my personal view is it's more likely that we would see the issuance of a central bank digital currency using technologies like Ethereum or Algorand. Uh, 
but I don't think personally it's going to be on the public chain it, itself. But you never know. I mean, uh, countries have done it, right? Uh, so yeah. who knows? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and I think we, we probably have uh, tons of other interesting uh, projects uh, on our grant. We, we we don't necessarily need a CBDC. I'm even not sure if I want <laughs> our grant to have its own CBDC. Exactly. Remember, Algo and, and others are the hedge to fiat currencies, right? That was the whole idea, I think. If you look at the, the Genesis block of the Bitcoin blockchain, didn't it have like a, a news article from the Times or something talking about banks busting or whatever, I, I think, if I remember correctly? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, John. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, talking to you. As as you can hear, I know I'm, I'm now talking to people who are listening to us. Uh, a lot of interesting uh, stuff ahead of uh, Algorand, both on the technology side. Uh, once we have uh, like the Algo Kit being used even more, one click nodes, we'll see even more interesting applications on top of uh, Algorand. So. Uh, if the, you are interested uh, to start building, uh, I'll uh, provide some some links to to start uh, under this video. And uh, I've been, uh, you know, it was clear pleasure to, talking to you, John. Uh, I'm happy that you found time for for this conversation. Uh, so thank you so much for all the work which you are doing for for Algorand. Thanks, Ancek. Great to be here.